Before we get started, let me simply say this. It is such an encouragement uh, to me and to our family and to our church and to our team from Kentucky to be here. Uh, I want to let you know that all of my family that is here, all of my team that is here, were so disappointed to know that I was preaching instead of Andy Longley. So if you have come this morning because you look forward to hearing Andy, I hope that you'll be encouraged by the good news of Jesus Christ, regardless of who uh, tells you about Jesus this morning. But you are not alone if you are hoping to hear from Andy this morning. Uh, as I prayed about this Sunday and prayed about this passage, uh, I've, I've chosen uh, this particular passage because I sense for all of us, uh, wherever you have been over these past couple of years throughout the world, we all are, I think, in a desperate need of a season of encouragement. So as the Longwees encourage us this week, uh, I hope that I can be of some sort of encouragement to you as we consider the gospel message of Jesus uh, preached from this great text from Isaiah. To simply remind us all that, yes, there is a curse that exists on this earth. It has been here since Genesis chapter 3. And yet also, there has been a movement of God from all time, since the beginning of time, to bring about his good, loving, sovereign, encouraging, gracious plan. That he is moving us in the direction of goodness. And his ultimate plan is greater than any pandemic, any financial crisis, or even our deaths. His plan is moving us in a good, good way. I hope that you heard that as we read Romans 8 earlier, this future glory that exists for us all. So here's my proposition for you this morning. I pray that the Lord will lift your hearts with his encouragement as we consider the greatness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we all be encouraged in our souls this morning. I have two points that I want to offer. Uh, the first is for us to see the foundation of our encouragement. And then secondly, the application of our encouragement. Uh, you need to know most of what I will say is related to the foundation of our encouragement. And then one simple application. But first, let's consider this foundation of our encouragement. Look back in our passage. The section of Isaiah reveals God's good plan for Old Testament Israel. In spite of their ongoing unfaithfulness, which was great, the Lord continued to remind them of his ongoing plan. As you heard in the chapter, you notice this theme which takes this damaged and turned them into something that would be whole. The picture here is of captives set free and of gladness coming instead of mourning. You need to know they deserve mourning. You need to know they deserve discouragement. It was only because of the Lord's graciousness that they could ever hope for anything else. Ultimately, there is a comparison made of these people of God compared to a strong oak tree. Now, I don't know your trees, but where we are from in Kentucky, we have great oak trees. We have a park near where we live where we often go, and it's called the Veterans Oak. And people go there and they write their names on the tree or they make prayers or promises around that tree. But the picture there is to see something that is outrageously strong. And that is what God is saying to his people, to his followers, is that in Christ, you're strong. He is making us strong. Old Testament Israel provides both our historical roots as well as a picture of this journey of faith. Notice verse 8. We see God's character revealed with what he loves and what he hates. We see here that the Lord loves justice. He loves when his people are not mistreated. That's what he loves. He hates robbery. He hates wrong. Aren't you glad to know that that's who our God is? Aren't you glad to know that that is his character? That he is on the side of goodness. He is on the side of truth. He hates what is wrong. He is opposed to evil. So these people who he created and who he loves, he wants them to prosper in his way and in his goodness. In spite of their sin, which had been great. In spite of the brokenness of the world, which in, they lived in which we find ourselves now. He is reminding us that there is a greater plan. His overall movement toward them and toward us is good. I think the foundation of our encouragement is best revealed here in the rest of verse 8. 
And that is that God will make, quote, an everlasting covenant with them. This everlasting covenant has direct application to you this morning and everything that you believe about Christianity. I think the best way to think of an everlasting covenant is simply to recognize it is a relationship of blessing that never ends. Unlike relationships that we see throughout this earth or TV shows that depict relationships that come to an end almost immediately, the relationship that God has with us in Christ is eternal. As Andy prayed, God had us on his mind before the creation of the world. He will continue to pursue us in love throughout all of eternity. The Bible reveals that God's chosen way of relating to people and to creation is in the form of a covenant. It's a promise. It's a promise that he has initiated, that he has provided, that he has fulfilled. You need to know this morning, if you know Christ, if you love him, if you have any encouragement by his spirit, it's because it was his idea. It's because he wants you. It's because he is passionate for you. It's always been his love and us as his recipients. This is a relationship in which the superior partner guarantees to care for those with whom he enters into this relationship. This text in Isaiah 61 is calling this everlasting covenant, this eternal covenant, is the same thing that we read about in Ezekiel and Jeremiah known as the new covenant. This is the fulfillment of the entirety of the Bible in which Jesus secures for us. And it is here inside of this covenant that we find the reading of our Bibles, the understanding of the church, the practice of the sacraments. It is our Christianity that God has formed a relationship with us and that Jesus fulfilled it. With his spirit and life inside of us, now we are the recipients of all of these promises. This continuation of God's redemptive work from Genesis 3 until Christ returns, this is our faith. This is the foundation of our faith. So again this morning, understand, if you have believed upon Jesus and the Spirit lives inside of you, you're inside of this covenant. This covenant that Isaiah spoke of, this is for you this morning. This ancient, this mysterious the sovereign, this biblical, the supernatural, this relationship. It was for them, but it's for us. It's for us today. It's for the city. God initiated through Jesus the sacrifice, and he made available by his spirit for us. If I could, let me mention several aspects here of this relationship. And again, it's here. I hope that you will be encouraged. First, notice the words of this covenant are trustworthy. I don't know a better way of stating this in hope of encouraging you, but if you don't believe this covenant is great, consider the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, after Jesus was baptized and his earthly ministry began, he entered into a synagogue in Nazareth, and along with other passages from Isaiah, he quotes verse 1 of Isaiah 61, and he emphasized, Today. This scripture is fulfilled. The scripture that we have just read. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. These words of Isaiah now flow from the lips of the God-man. Our Savior, our King, the one who is returning to us. The one who came for us. When Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper, this is the blood of the covenant. It is this very eternal covenant he referenced. So please this morning, take a moment, stop here, and ponder. And just rest in your assurance of what is true that you have today. You can be confident in your standing in Christ because of what Jesus has said. These words are true. Of all that we know of Jesus, his words, his character, his ministry, his love of the poor and the destitute, his care for the lost, his seeking the lost, his patience with the confused and the wayward, his love for enemies, his prayers for the people, even his death, his resurrection and ascension. He is the fulfillment of this covenant. These are his words. 
Will you be encouraged this morning to see all that has taken place for you to be here, for your heart to be stirred in Christ? You can be confident right now in Christ. God is moving you in a good direction. I don't know what you're facing today, but I do know if you know Christ, then there is a greater movement than you could ever imagine. Be encouraged. He is real. These words are real. This relationship is true. If you are prone to worry as I am, if you are prone to anxiety as I am, if you're prone to doubt, if you're prone to just not think you deserve to be here, then be encouraged this morning. You don't deserve to be here. But God loves you so much. He has you here. He has pursued you. Second aspect of this foundation I want to highlight. First, we've seen that these words are trustworthy. But secondly, I want you to see that these words reveal our importance. And this is huge because this is so easy to forget. There's a universal leadership principle for all mankind, Christian or non-Christian. It goes something like this. If you don't know your role on the team, you're going to grow discouraged and confused. And that's true in church, it's true in business, it's true on a sports team, it's true at work, it's true in a family. If your calling is unsure, you will struggle to remain engaged. What will happen is if you don't know your role here at church, it's easy to find yourself getting bored. And when that happens, despair and depression are just around the corner and results are terrible. And I fear that this is happening all around us, even inside of God's kingdom where we have forgotten at times who we actually are. In Isaiah's day, God's people had rebelled against his law to the point that they had lost their privileged practice of their status as God's servants. So here's what was going on for them and see if you could relate to this today. They wanted to enjoy the created world so much that they no longer cared about the real world, which is God's rule in heaven coming to earth. Thus, they lived as blind refugees, confused and hopeless, just hoping for mere earthly pleasure. And notice, because of God's commitment to his eternal covenant and his ultimate care for his treasured possession, these people of Christ, he opened their eyes to something more. He opened their eyes to see what their function was on this earth. Notice verse 6 and see your role even this morning. He says, you will be called priests of the Lord and they will speak of you as ministers of our God. Did you catch that? You have a role today. You have a calling today. All of you who know Christ, the destiny of the unfaithful servants, those who had been exiled in Babylon, is that God would renew them in such a way that they would serve as his priests. They would serve as his ministers throughout the world. You need to know this. A priest is one who serves the Lord by praying and sacrificing for others. So understand this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have a role, you have a task, you are important today. If you belong to Christ, then you are someone's priest. You have the high calling to sacrifice for someone today. You see, just as Jesus is praying for us today because his spirit lives inside of us, then we do those things similar to what Jesus does. It will honor Jesus because you're aligning your life with what he has been doing for all eternity is what happens when you do this. So here's the deal. I cannot promise what God will do exactly with your friends and family, but I can promise that God will honor your prayers for those in need. I can also promise that you will struggle in discouragement if you have forgotten that you have a very important title and task. Do you know who you are this morning? LCPC, do you understand who God is calling you to serve today? Who needs your prayers? 
Who needs your finances? Who needs a phone call from you today? Who needs a reminder that God loves them? Who needs a friend? I heard a quote the other day that we are now in the loneliest time on earth. Now, I don't know how you quantify such a thing, but I tend to believe it's probably true. You see, you are important. This is not a time to retreat. No, now is a time to pray. Now is a time to fast. Now is a time to serve. Now is a time to give. You might be thinking, man, that sounds like a lot of work. I'm saying, yeah, it is, because you're important. God has given you his spirit, and his spirit is at work. So you see how this is encouraging this morning? You know, I I don't know if sports analogies that I would use in the U.S. would would apply here. I know football is not actually football. I understand all of that. But, But you get the idea. If you're a Christian, you're not on the bench. If you're a Christian, you're in the game. You're a player. You're a participant. My son, Keaton, is here this morning. He's playing American football this year. He doesn't know what position he's going to be playing in the fall. He'll find out this summer. He will either really, really like his team or he won't like it once he finds out. But either way, if you are a Christian this morning, you're a priest of the Lord. You're called to pray. You're called to serve. You're called to give. You're important. You're in this game. So this covenant is guaranteed by Jesus himself. This this covenant makes us participants in his work. But lastly, I hope you'll be encouraged. Notice that these words form our entire identity. Look back at verse 10, particularly the second half. It says here that he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. You see, these unfaithful refugees with whom Isaiah was preaching will have descendants who will be clothed. Not what they can do in themselves, not what they can imagine in and of themselves, not in their despair, not in their religion, no, but who we are in Christ by what the blood of Jesus has achieved for us. Do you see the gospel message of Jesus when Christ comes? He died for us and his blood now covers us as a garment. There is a layering over us, a form which covers our very being. Do you see the picture here? This robe in Isaiah is what identifies our bodies, identifies our souls, identifies our lives. Please don't miss this. This is how we see each other and how we see ourselves. And most importantly, this is how the Lord sees us. You see this morning, if you know Christ, when God the Father looks at you, he no longer sees your sin, but he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. So therefore, he can look at you and say, there is my son, there is my daughter, with whom I am well pleased. God the Father is proud of you this morning. God loves you this morning because of Christ. His perfection is our covering. So we can now look at each other the way the Father looks at us. Christ has made us righteous. Do you know how precious you are to the Father? In Christ, you could not be more loved. We deserve absolutely nothing, and yet what we get is more than what we could ever imagine. See, this covenant is supernatural. It takes wayward, injured, uninterested people and transforms us into kings and queens. Jesus and his relationship to us is our foundation. He is eternal, and thus so are we. So I ask you this morning, how do you apply this encouragement today? How do you apply the reality of this foundation that we have? If I could offer one verse, it would simply be this. And that is in verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. 
So church, I ask this morning, will you do that today? We, will you, in the midst of all that is taking place in our world, in the midst of who knows what circumstances and pain you are going through this morning, will you in your mind, will you in your heart, will you in your soul rejoice that God is the Lord? We will not find our encouragement for our lives if we only dwell upon all that is wrong. But we will find encouragement when we are reminded that there is a God and he is moving in a good way because Christ has done that. Jesus is worthy of our heart's desire. He reminds us he has a loving and a good plan. Amen. Amen. Let me pray and then we will sing our final song.